Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk. And uh, in this talk, we are going to share you with one of our recent work on the application auditing. So we built a framework to identify the private data collection behaviors uh, from mobile applications, uh, particularly Android applications. So this is outline for today. Uh, first of all, uh, we are going to give you a very brief introduction about ourselves. And second is a background. So in this part, we are going to give you a summary on the uh, data, pro data protection regulations around the world. And uh, we will focus on uh, what kinds of implications were those data protection regulations um, introduced to the device vendors and application developers. The third part, we're going to introduce you our framework. We propose a few manual and automatic techniques to identify the data collection behaviors from the mobile applications. And fourth, so based on our work, uh, we will give a summary and also some recommendations on the uh, private data protection on mobile platforms. And so we are going to have for uh, the fifth part will be like five minutes Q&A session. So first about ourselves, uh, my name is Bai Wendong and uh, I'm a senior lecturer from the University of Queensland, Australia. And my research is on mobile security and the protocol analysis. And my partner, Zhang Qing, he is now a senior Android security researcher from ByteDance. And his research direction is Android security and payment security. Uh, this is actually my third time to give presentation in Black Hat. I still remember my first talk is in Amsterdam in 2015. So I introduced my uh, work on the application authentication uh, in Black Hat Europe. <clears throat> Later in 2017, uh, both myself and Zhang Qing gave another talk on 3G and 4G scanning in Black Hat Asia. And it's, my, it's our honor to give the third talk today. Second, the background. Um, so nowadays, the mobile devices already become the integral part of our daily life. We rely on a massive number of applications to do uh, social engineering, online banking, online shopping, and financial services, and so on and so forth. It has been well known that those applications may collect our personal data including the location, uh, device ID, SIM card information, and sometimes even purchase or browsing history. They claim they are going to use those data for purposes like analytics, uh, application functionality enhancement, and product personalization, and also third-party advertising. So this may raise concerns as well. Uh, for example, I demonstrate a recent study, uh, this is here. That study analyzed a few messenger applications. So they identify that some applications may even request access to tens of types of personal data, even sometimes uh, purchase history and financial information. So this raises privacy concerns. First of all, when we give access to those applications, we don't know how, how they are going to use our data and to whom they are going to share our data with. And second, those applications may reuse a few popular SDK or libraries for analytics or uh, online advertising. This create opportunities for some malicious entities to do cross-application tracking on users 
and also user profiling. So they may get our behaviors in different applications so that it's easier for them to track the users. So to protect the uh, data, especially personal and private data, uh, many countries and regions already put in place some strict data protection regulations. Uh, for example, in US, uh, we, we know the famous CCPA, and uh, in Europe, European Union, we know the, the most well-known uh, GDPR. And also in Asia, we have different countries and regions already enact uh, the data protection regulations. So next, we're, what we're going to talk about is uh, what kind of requirements are introduced by those regulations and more importantly uh, what kind of implications will be caused onto our uh, developers and also device uh, device manufacturers so i'm going to use gdpr to uh, as a case study to show you this so gdpr came into force on um, uh, May of 2018 in European Union countries, and it was a major update to the uh, European Union Data Protection uh, Directive introduced in 1995. So how you can understand GDPR, basically I, I would recommend you to uh, get these six aspects. The first one is what? So um, basically, the GDPR is applied to those, they call it data controllers who are um, processing the personal data of uh, EU or UK residents. Second one is which, so what kind of data is under the protection of GDPR? So basically any information related to uh, Europe, uh, to EU or UK citizens whether they can be identified directly or indirectly. The third aspect is why. So why is GDPR proposed? Is to protect the personal data from uh, misuse and to ensure data privacy. The fourth aspect, how? So later I will give you more details in the next slide, but here you can just summarize it into two aspects. The first aspect, it, GDPR uh, imposes more strict obligations to data controllers. And second aspect is GDPR tries to kind of give back the rights, the control to the data owners to handle their own data. So in next slide, I'll give you more detail. And uh, the scope, uh, GDPR will be applied to, you know, globally. Uh, to any organizations who process the information of European Union or UK residents. And the last aspect is the penalty. So any infringement or uh, major data breach will result in large penalty. This can be up to uh, 20 million euros or even 4% of the you know, the entity's global revenue. So let me zoom into the how. Uh, basically, GDPR has six principles. So the first one, um, the personal data should be processed uh, lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner. So basically, for the uh, processing of the private data, uh, those, you know, operations of processing need to follow the law and also need to be fair to the data owners and also need to disclose um, everything to the data owners. The second principle, uh, personal data should be collected um, for specified explicit and legitimate purpose. So that means, um, you know, uh, the data controllers cannot arbitrarily collect the data. They should declare that purpose to the data owner. Then follow that purpose, they can collect the data used for that specific, specifically for that purpose. 
and the set principle, uh, the personal information should be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary. So it's quite similar to the least uh, privilege principle. And fourth, um, the data should be accurate and whenever it's necessary, necessary keep up to date. And fifth, uh, it's about the period the data can be retained by the uh, data controllers. So this time should be um, as short as possible. The last principle uh, is about what kind of mechanism uh, should be taken to protect the collected data. So the principle requests the data controllers to uh, apply appropriate protection mechanisms on the uh, data, the user data they collected. So I just have a very quick uh, summary, on, not summary, but introduction on what is the difference between GDPR and other regulations. So mostly the principles are generally applicable, but there is some minor difference, especially on the scope and application region of those regulations. So for example, here I list the scope and region difference between uh, US CCPA and uh, Euro uh, Europe Union GDPR. So you can find that they have, you know, for GDPR is applicable to the entities in Europe and also to those entities who process data uh, related to Europe citizens. And for CCPA is on the other way. Uh, is to applicable to the uh, California resident and also to those uh, entity organizations who do business in uh, California. So with those regulations, um, those device vendors or market managers also provide um, strict requirements for um, privacy policies. So. For example, here I take the Google Play as an example. Uh, you can see the, the highlight words um, in, in this slide. So it requires the data controller, basically those applications to protect the privacy and uh, give the legal use to, to the users. Um, and also they need to be transparent uh, to the users who they collect data from. And other things, informations are also listed in the requirements. So whoever wants to upload their applications to Google Play must satisfy those requirements. Basically, those requirements can be summarized into four aspects. So the applications need to make explicit, make clear to the users what kind of data they're going to collect and what is the purpose to collect the data. And if they are going to share the data to whom, and also need to uh, to be transparent to the users how um, they are going to protect the user state. And it also has very uh, clear definition on the uh, user data. So they need to, you know, for those applications, if they want to handle user data, they need to disclose. Uh, the application's access, collection, use, and sharing of the data, and they need to limit the use of the data. And if this user data happens to be uh, personal and sensitive information, so I will uh, introduce this thing uh, in next slide, they need to give an uh, explicit um, privacy policy. So you can find those personal and sensitive information include uh, so-called personally identifiable information. So those information can directly or indirectly linked to the user. And then financial payment information, authentication information, uh, phone book, contacts, device locations, and so on and so forth. So if the applications uh, involves the use of such data, they need to fulfill those uh, six, oh, sorry, five uh, requirements like to limit the access, collection, use, and sharing, and to post uh, explicit uh, privacy policy, 
and uh, to handle the privacy data in a secure way and so on and so forth. So if you uh, go to Google Play, you look at those major applications, um, you will find that they have such privacy policy. So basically in those policies, they usually cover uh, these six same themes. Uh, the first one is how the application will collect the data is through API, through camera, through microphone, or through what. And the second, um, what is the purpose um, to collect the data? And third is the period the application will keep the data. And uh, if they are going to share the data to whom and when they are going to share. And also they will uh, make it clear what kind of control the data owners have. And the last one is they you know, involve some children's data. They need to give a more clear policy on that. So the next part is about the framework. Uh, basically, after studying those regulations and the Google's policies, we try to propose a framework uh, so that it can be used to automatically or semi-automatically um, do the application auditing on the private data uh, processing. So our motivation or our goal is, you know, when, when we're going to conduct uh, application uh, privacy compliance auditing, how can we ensure that the testing or auditing covers uh, most, if not all, most uh, privacy compliance issues? Because, you know, the privacy data can be uh, scattered, like uh, distributed in the system. So sometimes you need to use APIs to access, and sometimes you may just need to use um, some um, sensors or camera or microphone to collect those data. So it's, it's quite tedious for the auditor to assess every aspect during the auditing process. So our motivations, um, we are trying to kind of uh, break down or kind of push from regulations to practice because you can find the regulations, as I just mentioned, is quite in a principle level. They are sometimes abstract, theoretical, or complex. So we're gonna really, you know, push this thing into into a practical tool. The second motivation is the uh, from passive to active. Uh, that means those stakeholders like application developer, users or manager of market, application market, is kind of current reaction is, is, why, is very passive, you know, they identify all that vulnerability there, they, they just do some response. Um, but is it possible, you know, before that, that vulnerability uh, is identified by user or exploited by attacker, um, can we identify them? So, it's kind of from passive to active. Uh, the last part is from research to application. So we have a that we have a much experience in this area. So we're thinking: is it possible for us to uh, put what in our brain into some you know, real world application, some hands-on things, and some tools or guidelines that can be followed um, in assessment or auditing. So we follow such a thing. Uh, we have a global view. Uh, basically, we take into consideration the entire data life cycle. And meanwhile, we are going to break down um, into enforceable uh, checklist or tools. So this, you know, result in two level thing or in our framework. The logic level, so it's from the uh, global view. We are gonna give information to the decision makers or managers, you know, to let them have a big picture about the potential scenarios where privacy issues may occur. And meanwhile, we are gonna give uh, enforceable uh, guidelines to the auditors and analysts for them to make um, 
inspections in an efficient and comprehensive way. So, in a logic level, we consider the entire uh, data lifecycle, including the data collection, uh, data transmission, storage, and data use. So, what we do is we break down these four types into a few items, and uh, for each item, we give description. So, this is to you know let the uh, decision maker to understand what does this item cover, and sometimes the Items need to be manually um, checked, and uh, if possible, we will provide some automation tools. So, for example, here uh, for the collection of user data, we break down it into four items. And the first item is to collect and use data, um, you know, within the scope of uh, user authorization. So, this it will check whether the collection of user data by the applications go beyond uh, the data they claim that they list in a uh, privacy policy. So the same thing for other items, and I will leave it for your uh, reading instead of uh, look through it one by one. So we further uh, break down them and make them enforceable uh, into the enforcement level. So I identified kind of exit points uh, where we can check those um, violations of the you know user private data collection. So for example, uh, for the network request, uh, we check whether application upload user data and uh, what kind of data they will upload. And uh, when they upload, do they um, encrypt the, the data? And also, do they uh, access and upload some uh, data which shouldn't be, which is out of the use, out of the purpose they claimed? And in uh, uh, in our framework, we also take into consideration the policy difference among countries. So, for example, in some countries, uh, the regulations require uh, dynamic granting. So whenever the application use a permit a permission, they need to get users um, granting at that runtime. And some is one-time granting, it's like during application installation or logging, the user need to check the policy and give the permission uh, to the user. So next I'm gonna uh, have uh, my partner Jansin to give you more introduction on our framework. So he will focus on the enforcement level to give you the tools and the techniques that we use in our framework. And also he will give you a demonstration. Hello everyone, I'm Zhang Qing. Uh, let me introduce you several automatic tools in the framework made by us and the test results. The first one is the domain test tool. It can obtain all IP addresses and the domains from application to check if they belong to trustworthy entities. The second one is the privacy proper window test tool. It can test if application obtains users' privacy information before users uh, user agrees to privacy policy using a hook. Uh, the third one is application scan tool. It can check all the APIs related to privacy. The last one is the traffic detection tool. It can obtain all network traffic of the application we running. We use these tools to check the part of the privacy issues. Uh, here is some typical privacy information in the Android system we use this tool to check. Uh, there are three types of permission in Android system, but we just focus on two of them. One is dangerous permission, another is normal permission. About the dangerous permission, you need to request the wrong time permission in your application before you can access the restricted data or perform restricted actions, such as location. 
above the normal permission, uh, you just need to add it in the manifest file. You will get the data, such as Wi-Fi information. Here we list uh, many common privacy information associated with. Some of them will surprise you. The first one is Android serial number. There are four ways to get it in different Android versions, such as we can use the static field serial uh, to get it without any permission on Android 8. We can also use the function uh, get serial to get it on Android 8. Uh, this function needs the reader full state permission, which is a dangerous permission. Very surprising, right? Uh, the second one is Wi-Fi information, such as we can read the address file uh, to get the MAC address. Uh, we can also use the ERP file to get the root MAC address. Uh, this completely bypassed API requirements. What's more, uh, there are several information uh, people often refer to. Too. Uh, such as the Android ID, uh, application list, uh, and the clipboard. Unacceptedly, uh, this information don't need any permission to be able to read them uh, in some Android version. Uh, here we just talk about the information uh, in some Android version. There may be some changes with Android update. <laughs> We just uh, see some API functions. Let's talk about the field. We know uh, that there are some hooking tools. Uh, there are some hook tools to monitor function calls, uh, such as Frida and Expose. Uh, but we can't use these tools to hook a field call, such as uh, build point serial. Here, I, uh, we have done an uh, automated and uh, instrumentation technique technology to achieve static field mounting. Let's see how we did it. The first step is uh, DEX to Smiley, then add the log and self signature hook modules to the last DEX. The second step is add the log code to those places after the field. Then we add the signature code to the application class to make sure we can replace the original signature. Now we can build all the taxes. Then um, we use the new taxes to replace the taxes in the APK. Finally, we can sign the APK using your own signature. Now, uh, when the application is running, uh, the field uh, when it's used, the log will print. Here is the video demo. Here is a video demo to show how the automated tool work or monitoring the access about uh, user privacy information before agree the privacy policy. We add uh, some getting the privacy information actions when user reads the privacy policy file in the demo. Then we use the tool to test it. We can see the call log and the call action results uh, are recorded in the SD card files. Let's look at the demo.
You can see the using log are recorded in this file. We can also the static statics are recorded in this file. Okay, mm, this is the demo. Let's see the next clip. In this page, we have categorized the functions related to similar senses. Uh, there are certain types of privacy information in this table. For example, we classified we classify BSZD, SZD, and the MAC address, and so on, as Wi-Fi related. And uh, uh, other, also other privacy information, at least. Then we use the automated tool to test about 1,000 and 500 popular applications from several application stores. The test aspects are the access about uh, user privacy information in the table. The two pictures show the uh, statistical results about our test. We did a total account about 1,000 1, applications called some privacy related functions, even except uh, task and system property, in which there are also 579 applications using a normal ways to get the privacy information. The figure on the right shows how many application calls were made for each of the 13 types of privacy information. On this page, the left one shows how many applications using the different kinds of privacy information. On the, the right one shows how many times of the two, two types of permission related or privacy information functions called. We found that the number of the function call for privacy information about the normal permission was quite high. Okay, um, that's the test. That's all. Uh, let's go on and continue. Thank you. Thank you, Zhang Qin. Uh, so now we come to the uh, last part of today's presentation. And uh, in summary, uh, we propose a framework um, which, which can be used to audit uh, Android applications for the private information uh, call collection behaviors. And uh, our framework covers both a uh, logic view to give the decision makers a big picture about different scenarios uh, that may involve privacy uh, leakage. And we also provide the analyst and auditor uh, enforcement level uh, tools and techniques uh, for the um, hands-on actually practical auditing. And we also, based on this work, we also uh, list several recommendations to the mobile device users. Uh, basically, the users should uh, pay attention to two aspects. The first one is to try uh, upgrade uh, the operating system to the latest version. So here I use Android as an example. You can find Android use some new mechanisms for the privacy protection including restrictions on the user unresettable uh, data items and also some user um, resettable identifiers uh, like the advertisement ID 
and also uh, it may enforce further permission to access some particular data. Uh, for example, in Android 10 and Android 11, if the application want to access the Wi-Fi or network APIs, uh, they need to get a fine uh, location permission. The other recommendation we want to give to the user is uh, pay attention to those privacy policies released by the applications to check how the application will collect, use, share uh, the personal data. So that is all uh, about the uh, talk today, and we are happy to uh, take questions. Thank you.